Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone got here OK. There wasn't too much traffic. Weather's really great, but definitely preferable to where I live in Kentucky. So uh, happy about that. Um, I'll begin it with just like a little bit about me, um, just a little introduction and sort of like the things that interest me. Um, ties in a little bit uh, later in the presentation. Uh, I'm Tim Meehan. Uh, I've been working on Presto since 2018. Uh, I worked for five years at Meta, and now I currently work at IBM. Uh, I also chaired the Technical Steering Committee, um, so just sort of like lead that group to just solve whatever problems or, you know, kind of like resolve whatever disagreements that uh, need to be solved and try to uh, put out the technical direction of the project in a way that is coherent both for ourselves and also for the external community. Um, so work in progress. Um, so professionally, uh, at a very abstract level, I love hard challenges. I'm sure everyone here you know, can resonate with that to some degree. Um, but I, I guess like, um, I like problems that require lots of careful thought and design. Um, so, you know, some sort of strategy, especially if the strategy is somewhat new or unique, you know, so like, you know, it's, uh, there's maybe hints at a way to go about it, but no clear answer. Um, so, you know, for most of my career, I've gravitated towards data problems as being kind of like among this class of hard challenges, because I think in data, you don't find just simple solutions or hacks often. What you find is trade-offs, just lots and lots of trade-offs, kind of like endless trade-offs. Um, and so I am fascinated by all the trade-offs that one finds in data, and in big data in particular, and I find myself still learning and growing with this space. So that's just sort of like my professional interest and what keeps me here with the Presto project. So enough about me. Uh, here's what we'll talk about today. Um, we'll start with like a little bit of history of data infrastructure to the best of my ability. If this were comprehensive, I'd be here for hours. So this is just a, an abbreviation of sorts. Um, but we'll start with like a little history of data infrastructure. We'll move on to big data and how, you know, very condensed version of how we got to the big data era. Um, we'll take a look at some of the current trends, some of the trends that I think are important. Um, then we'll look at the ways that Presto is capitalizing on those trends and the way that it's kind of like moving in that overall direction. And then finally, a little call to action. So data infrastructure, how did we get here? So meaning like, how did we get to a conference talking about half of, half of a database? Like, where's the, where's the storage? There's no storage. Um, it, it's a, it's a kind of like left to the user to provide the storage. So how did we get to a conference talking about just the, kind of like the top half of a database, uh, you know, like a, a whole chunk of it is missing. Um, it's just the query. So we'll start into the 1970s. Uh, a, you know, a computer scientist named Edgar F. Codd invented the relational model of data management. And so, you know, this included really at the time features that we take for granted, but which were revolutionary at the time. So things like primary keys that guaranteed uniqueness, uh, foreign keys that you know, kind of like made sure that you could join data in a way that's coherent and, and sensible. Uh, indexes to make data access faster. So like all that was kind of like um, new to that time. Uh, the early SQL databases were used for operational data. So you know, to support decision making because like you know, sometimes you need to kind of like extract insights from that and then you know, make use of that data. So, you know, over time, that would happen more and more often. Uh, and so, you know, what people do, did before, you know, kind of like this next bullet is they would just copy a lot of it into a different database. And there was just a ton of data copying and a ton of redundancy. And as you can, as you can tell, like, there was just a lot of waste and a lot of performance issues. And it was, just a, it was just a mess. So around this time, then, we started to kind of like design what would, we would call the data warehouse. And so, like, there was data warehousing concepts that were developed like, you know, um, dimension tables and facts and, and uh, then, you know, techniques to optimize queries to support these, you know, kind of like um, these new SQL queries that were, op you know, operating over that data. So that's the data warehouse. Um, and so data warehousing, you know, kind of like made a lot of progress over time. 
but we get into the next phase, which kind of like tests the limits of these previous solutions, which is basically what happens when you do the set scale. And so the, the data, you know, kind of like the to the internet, once again, very overly simplified, but you know, the internet comes along, people, you know, websites explode, we have the dot-com boom, and, you know, data becomes, you know, we're adding more and more data into these warehouses, and um, they struggle to keep up with the demand. Um, and so then we enter the, the birth of the big data era in the early 1990s. And so what are some of the technologies that kind of like enabled, you know, this big data era? So the, the first one is HDFS or Hadoop. And so, you know, Hadoop did something really crazy, which is that you can just add more machines, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like turn it into a dollar problem. So you can basically take your commodity hardware, add your commodity hardware to your HDFS cluster, and you can scale out with dollars. And so, you know, like, you know, there's kind of like this linear dollar amount that scales with your data, means you can plan for it and budget for it. Um, so that was pretty revolutionary. But what do you do with the data? Like, you know, and so, you know like how do you translate that into insights and action and stuff like that? And so MapReduce was open sourced. Uh, a lot of this based off of prior art at Google. Uh, as always, you know, like lots of infrastructure was developed early at Google. MapReduce is developed. So we operate over this big data with a paradigm that allows us to split large amounts of work into little jobs that you can write in Java. So it's programmatic. You write little Java programs, and they split up and kind of like do orchestrate themselves and kind of like get you this you know, data output. Um, but obviously, that requires specialized skills, and you need specialized infrastructure engineers to write all those things and to extract the insights. And obviously, that's very expensive. Um, and so in 2010, we have Apache Hive. And so, you know, like the, the, you know, people are starting to realize, well, what if we treated this giant HDFS blob as kind of like, this is starting, we're starting to realize, what if this is kind of like a database? And this is kind of like the bottom part of the database. And what if we had an interface kind of like all those SQL databases we had all the way in the beginning? And so Apache Hive comes along with the SQL-ish kind of language that kind of translates that into MapReduce jobs and kind of like allows you to not have to have that specialized knowledge. You don't need to write Java code and, and, and all that. So that's like, you know, kind of like revolutionary. And, and not only that, but in order to support that, you need a catalog because you need to name things. So you need to say like this group of files in this location in this directory represents a table. And so like we start to kind of like start to catalog, um, you know, the, the, this evolving data warehouse. Um, and then this kind of like, you know, turns into what we, you know, start to call data lake and thinking around data lakes begins to emerge where what if you didn't have to warehouse your data immediately? What if you could just dump it somewhere and figure it out later? So that's the data lake. Um, and so around this time, Presto is born. And so Presto kind of like says, well, you know, all this unnecessary stuff that you're kind of like loading up and spinning up with, with Hive is not necessary. All you need to do is just go directly to the data source. You don't need this complicated infrastructure to get all this done. You can just query directly against HDFS with the Hive Metastore for your catalog. And so that was kind of like the insight that, that Presto brought. But we still had some you know, lingering problems with the data lake paradigm. Um, and so you know, what people discovered is, is that it's easy to store data, but it's still, even with a tool like Presto, it's difficult to extract. And so, you know, um, you know, the, you use the tools that Hive provides, but Hive is, you know, kind of like built for Hive. Hive is not built for a sophisticated data warehouse that you can query directly on your data lake. And so that brings us to today, where we start to think a little bit harder about these problems and make it so that it's easier to just go directly to your data source. So, you know, the groundbreaking innovation over the past few years has been to develop more structure onto the underlying storage itself. So, you know, first, obviously, there was ORC and Parquet, and so that organized your files into a particular format, but what do the files mean? There's no structure around what files correspond to which table. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, like, how do you ensure that there's valid statistics? How do you efficiently discover the data when you have lots and lots of the data? How do you partition the data and make it so that it's not kind of like something that a user has to understand? And how, basically, the, the short story is, like, how do you make it so that users don't even need to know 
you know, kind of like these low-level internals. They just kind of like uh, let the engine do its work. And so that, that's really kind of like what this is all about. Um, once again, Hive was designed for Hive. It was not designed for large multi-tenant, multi-engine warehouses where we don't want to have to copy the data. We want to go to directly to the data itself. And so some of the results are, you know, like we see today is we just have better data management with um, kind of like a modern table format. You get these premium features over commodity hardware that you, you kind of like never got with Hive, indexes and, and so on. And, and so, you know, to me it's clear that this is, you know, something that's only kind of, kind of become, going to become more and more entrenched. So, like, we're not going to go, oh, let's do the more expensive thing that makes us copy more. You know, like, we're not going to go in that direction. To me, it's pretty clear that we're going to go in more and more in a direction that keeps the data at the source, and we're just going to make that better and faster and easier. Um, and so, you know, to me, what this indicates is, is that, like, what we're talking about is your data really is going to exist in cheap storage that's centrally governed, and that's accessible through multiple interfaces. Um, because, you know, like, uh, there just doesn't exist one interface that, that does everything, uh, including your ML, including your batch and interactive. So, you know, people don't want, but people don't, at the same time, people don't want a new tool to access their data in a more performant manner. So, like, you know, people don't want to have to move over the data into a different system just because it needs to be fast. They want it to be fast where it is right now. Um, and so, you know, just in the same way that, like, I don't want to have to switch computers if I have, you know, 50 Chrome tabs. <laughs> I just want to keep it on my computer. Um, and so, like, th thinking about this like an analogy, um, you know, I'm going to date myself, but does, does anyone remember MapQuest? Did anyone use MapQuest? Raise your hand if you use MapQuest. <laughs> so, so a bunch of you raised your hand, so that's good. Um, you know, MapQuest, you know, was pretty revolutionary when it came out, right? It, it allowed you to get directions from any two points in the country, you know? Like, you just go to the website and you just punch it in, and it was awesome. Um, uh, before that, maybe you had a GPS appliance. Those were expensive, I think, when it first came out. You know, you could, or you could memorize the city roads in your city street. I don't have the memory for that. <laughs> my, my brain just doesn't work like that. Um, or, you know, you brought a map. You brought a physical map. Um, so, you know, even though it wasn't revolutionary, though, the, the experience wasn't ideal. Because, like, what did you have to do? You had to, um, you had to print them out. Um, and so what happens? Like, you miss a turn? The, the whole thing is like, you know, like, when did you miss the turn? <laughs> you know, like, it, it's, uh, you know, like it, it threw everything through a wrench. Um, and so, you know, like, let's, let's contra contrast this to now. You know, now I'll open up Google Maps in my browser. I'll take a look at multiple different locations, maybe do a little street view. Uh, you know, I'll put it on my car, because my car has the, you know, goes to the same Google Maps backend. Um, it'll tell me the directions in real time. It'll adjust if I miss a turn. And then, you know, like I park somewhere and I'm gonna put it up on my phone so that I can get directions from the parking lot to the, to the building. So, um, to, to me, I, I think, uh, you know, what's the point of all that? The point is, is that we have multiple interfaces. So we have it on the phone, the car, the PC, but it's all the same backend. There's no copy, right? So the, the point is, is that there's no copies. We, we wanna get rid of all the copies. So, and, and you know, like um, sometimes in this day and age, maybe it makes sense to print something. Maybe, you know, it seems rare and rare. Maybe I print something once a month, once every other month. Um, but why do I, you know, like by analogy, why would I want to copy my data from the lake to something else so that it can get outdated or the ETL pipeline can break or it's in a different system that has their own on call, their own experts and they, they go on vacation, you know, like, the, you know, <laughs> they're, they're people too. Like, you know, it's just a whole lot simpler if it all exists in one system. So how do we do that? How do we make it so that everything is kind of like in this one system? We don't have to copy so much. So, uh, and the way that we do that is we make the data fast as hell. We, we use one interface. So what have we been doing in this area? area? Because like Presto, that's all what you know, Presto has been doing is basically working in this direction, making it so that you don't have to do the copy. Um, so Presto, I call Presto the vertically integrated um, 
uh, query engine. So, so what does vertical integration mean? So let's take another kind of like example or analogy. So do you remember when Apple came out with the M1 chips? The M1 chips were, you know, the, they, were, they blew everyone away. Part, part of what made, you know, made them so fast is what Apple did was they took a look and said, well, what do people do with their computers? You know, they actually, 90% of it's JavaScript. I have an electron, little electron thing that runs my Slack, but a bunch of other stuff. It's all JavaScript, right? I have 50 browser tabs. Those are all running JavaScript in the background. What makes JavaScript fast? We have dedicated instructions for JavaScript and, M1 and, and subsequent uh, chips. They have a large L1 cache because due to details, that just helps JavaScript code. So really, that's all about doing more with less. It's not just making a fast chip, but it's making a chip that's designed for what people use it for. And so that's what we're doing with vertical integration. We're saying, what are people going to use Presto for? Yes, there is some aspect of I need a, you know, a MySQL database or a, a something else and a, and a something else. That exists and that's important. But what we're working on is we're making it fast as possible to make it so that you can get access from your lake as cheaply and quickly as possible so you don't have to do another copy. Um, and so, you know, like, uh, we'll get into, like, some of the ways that we've been doing this. Um, part of this involves, you know, table format, better table format support. The, these technologies that have allowed us to kind of, like, move on from Hive or kind of, like, improve Hive with, you know, better, you know, uh, more database-like features. Integrating deeply into these table formats is key to um, this you know, vertical integration. And so we've made a lot of progress with Iceberg. So we now support V2 reads. We have a dedicated syntax for, for time travel. We're adding caching support, advanced filter pushdown for Vilox. We'll, we'll get into that later. Um, thanks to the hoodie community, the, you know, we, we have a very advanced hoodie connector. And so we, we have lots of um, really good integration with table formats that makes this very seamless. Um, we have uh, kind of like a unique feature, uh, you know, optimizer, the history-based optimizer. The history-based optimizer, um, what does it do? It, you know, it optimizes repeated workloads. What are repeated workloads? Dashboards, batch jobs, how people use Presto. So the history-based optimizer um, leverages kind of like, you know, the, these historical similar queries. Lublena will talk about this today. I definitely encourage you to join that talk. Um, but, you know, like this is an, another example of vertical integration. Um, integrating Presto on Spark with native, with Velox, that's um, awaiting a little bit of a open source help, but, um, you know, like that's another example of like that deep vertical inter uh, integration and then just focusing on the optimizer. Um, but I think like um, a really, you know, what the community has been working very, very hard on, like, you know, maybe half of the community has been uh, the active contributors have been working towards this is, is C++. And so, like, how can we make it so that Presto is just blazingly fast, you know, um, using, you know, like the, the same old hardware, and that's, you know, optimizing using the, you know, the SIMD instructions that exist on the hardware that you can't leverage in Java. Um, and so, you know, like that's, you know, you know a, a large part of our vertical integration is, is better synergy with the underlying hardware um, through native. And so, um, and then just, you know, coverage, because, you know, this is a rewrite uh, of a lot of the, the Presto's code base. So, you know, at, we're adding support for Iceberg. We have, we re re rewrote the Parquet reader to be more performant. Uh, we added, filled in the functional gaps that allowed us to run TPCH, TPCDS, grouping sets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this, this brings me to a note that I want to highlight and, and share, you know, which is that, you know, like in the community, we've been talking about native workers for, you know, kind of a long time. It, it's a large project. It's a massive initiative. Um, you know, like we don't want to kind of like understate uh, how complicated that is. People are in production. So, you know, like we're, we're starting to kind of like get really promising results in production. We're starting to test it out on TPCH and TPCDS. Everything is prom pointing to very, very promising results. And so, you know, I think, you know, we want to move to the next phase, which is we want everyone to start using this. We don't want just big tech companies to start using it. Um, like we can't, you know, like this, this can't be, you know, just like a feature that 
only a few people use. Um, and so um, what we want to do is we want to make it so that native is the default. Um, so that, you know, this is, you know, like uh, basically when you load up Presto, when you join, you know, look at the Presto website and you start to download it, you get the native one. You don't get Java. Um, and so, you know, like we'll be working to um, basically add support for connectors, user-defined user types and functions, and uh, a dedicated manual for uh, the, the, um, the Presto queries that are supported uh, with native, um, which is very exciting to me. Uh, you know, finally, um, I'm going to kind of like close it up with, you know, something that I, I think is underappreciated, that, like this is an underappreciated fact, which is that the Presto community is the largest and healthiest community working on this vertically integrated uh, open data lake house query engine idea. So, you know, like uh, there are larger communities. There, there are, you know, different communities out there, but, um, you know, like we are among the largest that this is our focus. And no one's doing what we're doing. Um, so I, I think that, you know, like this is a very exciting time to be a part of the Presto community. And if you haven't been contributing, joining Slack, or, or uh, we'll talk about how, you know, how to contribute, I think now's a really great time to do that. Um, so, so then also, you know, like on, on open source and, you know, on the community, you know, like one point that I think it's like it's, it's common knowledge is, is that um, details in open source matter. Details are very, very important. How big is a community? You know, if I'm a company or if I'm a, you know, I'm starting a business, you know, am I going to start, am I going to pick a query engine that's written by one guy? Nope. Um, you know, it, how, does, how does the community govern itself? So, you know, like, how, how do they resolve conflicts? How do they add committers? How do they bring people into the project? How welcoming are they, you know, on bringing people into the project? That matters, because if I need something from that, and if I can't get it, and I've already made a massive commitment to join it, then I'm, I'm, I'm toast. Is it backed by a single commercial interest or a collaboration of many people? You know, because like, you know, of course there's misalignments between whoever's the, the, the primary backer and, and, and us. So like all of these details matter and are important. And I, I, to me, I think this is, this is common knowledge at this point. So the question for us, the question I would like to answer um, is can we trust Presto? Like, and so, you know, like let's look at the numbers. We've had an 80% growth in unique committers you know, uh, basically since the fork. Uh, there, there's been over a thousand new contributors since the beginning of the project and um, uh, almost half of that has been in the last three years. Uh, this past year has been a bumper year for uh, external contributions and I hope that that can, trend continues. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the details on, on, you know, like exactly how much it's increased, but. Um, there's been 285 new PR submitters, so individual submitters, new to the community, new to the Presto project, 285 over the past year, um, and over 1,000 GitHub stars. 70% growth in commits. So, you know, like, it's it, kind of hard to tell in this graph, but we, we are at basically, a, a, you know, a, a high that's around 70% greater than what it was from the baseline from the beginning of the year and then basically through the rest of the year before. Um, and we're doing a really good job today of closing issues and PRs. Um, so, you know, all of this, I, I think, points to us being a healthy, diverse, and accepting community. So, th to me, these numbers are very promising. Um, and so, you know, I'd just like to recap on, on what we're working on. We're, we're not just working on a, you know, on a query engine. We're dedicated to bringing kind of like the future of the lake house in an open source way, in a vendor neutral way, with reliable governance. Because we want to be in the center of this future, and we can't be in the center of this future if we're kind of like, you know, if we're not an open community. Like, you know, um, it, the, you know, whoever's backing that community, if they, if they, um, if they go away, then the, the community goes away. Um, and so, you know, all of this really excites the part of me that likes hard problems. Because, you know, building a community is a hard problem. It's, it's not easy. And it, there's no kind of like one-size-fits-all solution. You have to try things and it's, you know, something that you have to iterate on. Um, rewriting the query eval layer is a hard problem. 
um, but we're in production. So, you know, like the, the tackling hard problems thing, like that, that's why I like the Presto project is that these are all very hard problems and I think that we're, I think that we're winning. So join a winning team and get involved. Uh, join the Slack channel. Um, you know, uh, there's many different ways to, you know, uh, get involved if you haven't already. Join Slack, contribute to GitHub, close issues, look at issues, propose new ideas. Uh, if you're not sure where to get started, join a working group, just pop in. Um, they're very, you know, friendly places. It's, it's a great way to look at a part of the project without having to get overwhelmed with the entire project. So definitely, you know, think about joining a working group. Sign up for the mailing lists. Um, to get, you know, updates and, and news and, and stuff like that. And uh, that, that's it. Um, just wanted to thank everyone once again for coming. Hope everyone has a really great day, learns a lot of stuff about Presto, and uh, I'll hand it off to Naveen.